Hey folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. We've got a great line of segments uh, ready to go for you today. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, because I know we all are busy, to uh, take a look at what we have prepared for you. We hope, sincerely, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my contributors, that you enjoy everything you watch here. We do want to simply expand the hobby and make it a little bit more accessible to as many people as we possibly can. So we do thank you for... Uh, joining us here today. We're going to get down to it though, because I know you're here for these segments. Let's hit it. Hi, this is Ambie from Board Game Blitz, and this is Strategically Thematic, a segment where I talk about theme in different strategic games. This time, I'm talking about Captain Sonar. Captain Sonar is a team game where you and your team are on a submarine trying to find and destroy the other team's submarine. There are four roles, the captain, the first mate, the radio operator, and the engineer. Each role has a different function, and you have to work together in order to find and sink the other submarine before they can sink yours. There are also these huge player screens that you put across the table so that each team can only see their own submarine and teammates during the game. Some of the roles aren't very thematic, but I think a really neat mechanism that also feels pretty thematic is how the captain and radio operator roles work. During the game, the captain will choose where your submarine moves and call out the direction of north, east, south, or west. The captain will be keeping track of where your submarine is on the map using a whiteboard marker. Meanwhile, the other team's radio operator will be listening in on your movement and marking the movement on their own transparency sheet. The radio operator has their own map, so they can try to figure out where you are by overlaying your path with the map. The play between the captain and the radio operator is really neat, since the radio operator can't actually see where the other submarine is, but he uses what he hears through the radio to determine where it could be. In order to win, you need to shoot the other submarine down with torpedoes or mines. The captain decides when to use weapon systems or other systems that can help locate the other submarine, but the first mate and the engineer are the ones who actually know when the systems work and are ready to fire. So there's a lot of communication that needs to be done within your team, with the captain bringing everything together and making all the decisions. The game can be played turn-based or real-time, but I think the real-time mode adds a lot to the theme, since you wouldn't be taking turns in an actual submarine battle. Captain Sonar is a fun, hectic battle between two teams, and it's a great game to play when you have a big group of people. Because of the mechanics of the different roles, the game really makes you work together as a team to defeat the other submarine. Thanks for watching Board Game Blitz! As an aside, I've been running out of games that I own that fit this segment. I have some thematic but not very strategic games, like these story games, and I also have some strategic but not very thematic games, like these games that start with T and end with N. I also have a bunch that are neither. So let me know if you have any suggestions for future episodes. It's Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is Roll With The Punches, where we talk about randomness in games and how it can make a game exciting. And today we're gonna be taking a look at a super old game going way back. This is a game with a ton of randomness, and that is Talisman. So in Talisman, on your turn, you'll be rolling a die to move different spaces. As you move spaces around the board, a lot of these places will allow you to draw a card. Whenever you move, you get to choose whether you're going um, clockwise or counterclockwise around the board. So you have a choice of two different spaces normally. It's pretty simple. Um, most of the time, you're going to be drawing these cards off the deck, and they can be different things like, oh, it's a wild boar you have to fight. If you have to fight one of these off, you'll roll a die and add its strength, um, and then roll a die and add your strength, and whoever has the higher roll wins. So I got two plus two and then the wild boar rolls, normally your opponent would roll for you, and he got three all together, oh, I defeated the wild boar. Or you could draw something crazy like a dragon that has seven strength, which is obviously going to wreck me pretty bad because there's no way I can beat the, uh, the dragon's seven strength. So pretty crazy random there. You can also find awesome items like the unicorn, which will give me plus one strength and plus one craft. Craft is for using against certain, certain like mental attacks and stuff like that, and also allows you to get different spells and things like that that you can use. 
And then you can also find crazy portals and stuff that'll teleport you around the board. And this deck is all sorts of full of all sorts of crazy terrible and really good things. And you're just trying to upgrade your character with different items and try to upgrade your stats by going to different magic pools and different like life wells to get more hit points and things like that to make it so you can make it all the way up around the board you can go around and fight the uh, sentinel and make it up to get all the way to the crown of command and once you're at the crown of command you're able to drain the life points of the other players to knock them out of the game lots and lots of dice chucking lots and lots of randomness and it's just a crazy game Talisman is a game with an insane amount of randomness and the dreaded roll to move, but it's kind of interesting because you get to choose two different directions you're going to go with Talisman, whether you're going to go left or right. It's really just random most of the time, and the real choice in this game is just whether you're going to go for the crown of command and how, when you're going to start pushing towards trying to like make that happen. Um, there's random events, random things that pop up all over the place, and this is one of those games where it's like almost you just turn your brain off, you're not having to strategize, you're just rolling a dice and see what happens. And and it's kind of interesting when you can like mess up other players and try to steal their items from them or see somebody get turned into a frog after some crazy die roll where they rolled a one and then go over there and steal all their stuff. It's just a silly take that mess with each other game where you're not really strategizing that much. There's not a whole lot you can do to mitigate randomness in this game except for your little fate tokens and trying to make sure to use those at the proper time and trying to build up your character and take the crown of command. So definitely an old school game. Slap full of randomness, maybe too much randomness, but it's still fun and interesting if you want a light game, and that is Talisman. Hi everyone, I'm Mandy, and welcome to another segment of Confessions of a Board Game Reviewer. This week, we take a look at games we've reviewed in the past, and, well, we may have differing opinions about them now. I have to confess, I was way too excited about Kittens in a Blender. Go figure. Let's see what the other reviewers have to confess. I said before that I really enjoyed Above and Below, but unfortunately it's been replaced by Near and Far. A game that I had to change my opinion on after I played it? Coup. Don't play two players. When we played the first case of Mythos Tales, we really enjoyed it and wanted to play all of them. But when we did play all of them, there were so many typos and mistakes in the other cases that it ruined the game for us. I don't mind jumping on the hype train, so when I heard Mystic Veil vale came out, I loved it. But it's too fiddly, it doesn't work the way it does, so changing my opinion on this one. So there you have it. Those are confessions for reviews we've done in the past, but maybe have differing opinions about them now. Have you ever played a game where, in the past, you liked or maybe didn't like it and you've changed your mind? Go down in the comments section below and let us know. Join us next time when we talk about mm, equipment we've used for filming reviews that maybe wasn't so professional. Until then. Hey, it's Jay. And it's time to talk about your flare. On 15 pieces of flare, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. Some of these games come with some really awesome custom pieces. Like Clank has that dragon meeple. Or like Ex Libris has all those custom player pieces. Like the trash golem. Or like the Champions of Midgard expansion came with those little Viking helmets to count your points. But I've had this one guy on my Facebook page pretty much from when I started always suggest that I need to make something for the game Concordia. It's his favorite game. So Michael Vinoy, you asked for it buddy. And you're going to get yourself some Concordia flair. And no better piece other than the cloth to make some flair out of. So, let's check it out. For this project, we're gonna need a one by eight cut to about eight inches long. A two by four cut to about three or four inches long. Three two inch long nails, a hammer, and blue spray paint. First, we're gonna nail the two by four to the bottom of the one by eight. Make sure the bottom edges line up. 
Then we're going to spray paint the entire thing blue. After that is completely dry, make sure to spray paint the bottom blue also. Boom! There you have it. A quick and easy way to add some Concordia flair to your game room. Michael, you told me this was going to be impossible and I tried to think of something good to make for you. But this is the best I could come up with. At least it's kind of funny. And I bet you if anybody saw that, they're like, why do you have a blue square on your shelf? And then boom, you're playing Concordia. And that's always fun, right? So if any of you guys have any other games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below or shoot me a message on my Facebook page, pique your interest. Don't forget, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more and we encourage that. Have fun, everybody. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thresh, a mere thresh gaming for those of us who like to play alone. This week we're going to build the most beautiful stained glass windows we can with Sagrada, a dice drafting game with a solitaire variant. Sagrada is a game in which you're one of the artists creating stained glass windows for the Sagrada Familia Cathedral in Barcelona. It's the job of a lifetime but you're also competing with other artists to see who can create the greatest masterpiece. And how will we achieve this? With dice. Sagrada is kind of like dice Sudoku. Every round, you draft and place two dice, but you can't place dice next to each other if they're the same color or have the same number showing. Each game is a bit different because you can choose to work on a different window pattern. So while each pattern will have some color and number restrictions, for you to work with, there are some patterns that are a lot easier than others. In the solitaire variant of the game, you're up against an AI player whose points are determined by the number of pips on the dice that you don't draft during a turn, meaning that you have to focus on your own goals while making sure you don't give too many high value dice to the enemy. Your points are determined by the objectives that you draw at the beginning of the round, some of which encourage you to favor specific dice colors and some of which encourage you to go for specific dice patterns. For example, I would be rewarded in this case for having rows where each die is a different color, or columns where each die is showing a different number. If you beat your AI opponent after 10 rounds, then you win. I really enjoy Sagrada. It's easy to learn, quick to set up, and very quick to play, which makes it a great game to relax with on a weeknight, or to slip in when you just don't have that much time, but you still want to play a board game. I don't think it's going to end up as one of my all-time favorites, but I do think it's going to see regular play. Um, I also really appreciated that learning the game caused me to look up the cathedral that inspired it, so I actually became a smarter person for having played the game as well. Um, if you're interested in a light dice drafting game that is quick to learn and quick to play, then Sagrada may be a game for you. Happy gaming! Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Card Game Breakdown. So for this episode, I thought I'd do something slightly different. We've been talking a lot about card games since I've done the uh, budget card game breakdown. And what do you do with card games? Sometimes, some people, we sleeve them. And so I thought it'd be fun to show you some of the sleeves that I have, the ones I use, and tell you why I sleeve games and things like that. So if you look over here, uh, for lack of better storage, I've been storing them in the Burning Crusade expansion to the World of Warcraft board game, but whatever. The first thing is, I think this is a really neat accessory to sleeving because this is the Mayday, uh, it's a mouse pad and it's from Mayday Games, and basically they have a sleeve line, and if you put a card up on this chart here, and you'll see what color it co covers up, then you reference that color to these different little squares over here, and then it's going to tell you, what's, first off, what sleeve to buy of theirs, but more importantly, what the millimeter length is uh, and width of the card. So, pretty useful thing if you got some odd size cards and you can't you know if you use Mayday that's cool but if not you can at least use the measurements get online and find sleeves that that will fit it past that though I've got all these different sleeves here and like I said this is just kind of crammed in here but um, I use different sleeve companies uh, for instance these are ultra pros the uh, pros these are really good uh, for board game uh, the small cards and board games and such uh, you can see that the, the the smaller ones fantasy flight also has those as well 
And these are like premium thickness, so they're uh, a couple millimeters thick. I don't know if it actually says it on here, but either way. We have all the normal sleeves over here, which are essentially like the Magic the Gathering size cards or around that. And one tip that I've been doing, uh, which I didn't write on here, but anytime I take sleeves out of a pack, you know, this has 100 card sleeves, I will bend the corner down and usually I'll write how many I think are left. So if I took 23 out of here, I should be putting uh, 77 left up here. Now, obviously, sometimes with manufacturing, you'll get a sleeve or two over or maybe under what the pack says on it. But I've got tons of sleeves here. You can see these are the tarot size fantasy flight sleeves for like a really big card game such as uh, like infiltration is what I use these for. You got really thick sleeves. Uh, these are like the what you would put really expensive baseball cards in. I hardly use these for board games though, although I have used them for a couple of different things. And then you've got, you know, a lot of people know these uh, solid back sleeves. These are Yu-Gi-Oh size, which work tremendously well for Summoner Wars. They have the Ultra Pro, Pro logo. A lot of Ultra Pro has the logo, and I think it's neat, but it does sometimes get in the way uh, for, for a lot of games, uh, board games specifically. So, uh, just quickly, what I use for sleeve, uh, what I sleeve cards, if it's a board game, I'll usually only sleeve the cards that, a people, uh, that people handle a lot, the, the cards that are getting shuffled often, or the cards that really matter. Sometimes, you know, like in social deduction games, I'll put the, the solid back colored sleeves on those so that you can't see imperfections or dents and things like that. But for the most part, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a deck of cards that sits out on the table and you flip those over, no one ever picks those up or handles them, I usually stay away from sleeving them because sleeves are expensive and I don't want to constantly sleeve tons tons of games with every card in it, although it does look nice and everything. Uh, other than that though, like CCGs, I'll sleeve my deck. That's almost like a, 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 a it, it's gonna happen, right? Uh, a lot of people sleeve their decks in CCGs, but you don't really see it too much in games, uh, board games specifically because the sleeves are expensive. Uh, so there are very good deals online to get sleeves. And uh, I think that you know, I think it's worth it. I don't sleeve every game I own. Like I said, if I, if it's a game I'm kind of like, well, maybe we'll play it a few times, I'll sleeve the more important cards. Or, you know, if it's a game that I'm never going to play, or if it's a game that's really long, I usually don't sleeve it because we don't get it to the table often. But the games I play really, like a lot, like especially small card games I've been showing you, a lot of those are sleeved just because it makes sense. So, anyway, putting the question on you, what kind of games do you sleeve? What are your favorite brands of cards? I mean, you got Ultra Pro, Dragon Shield, you've got Mayday. I mean, there's a Fantasy Flight. There's all kinds of them. Uh, so what kind of sleeves do you use if you sleeve games? And when and why do you sleeve them? And maybe why not? Why don't you sleeve them? So uh, anyway, I hope you found this somewhat enjoyable. And uh, until next time, or if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timgenet at gmail.com. Follow me on social media below. Check out my podcast, Meeple Core. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hey, welcome to Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is We'll Learn As We Go, where I'm going to talk about some games and how I would teach those particular games. Um, and this week, I wanted to talk about my experience in teaching family level or introductory level variants. Um, these are variants that are designed, maybe that sometimes come in the rule books, or sometimes you have to find those variants online yourselves. Uh, but these variants are designed to make the learning game a lot smoother. Um, and sometimes I find that I usually just play with these introductory variants anyway, because they're a more streamlined version of how to play the game. Uh, so what I'm talking about specifically is, um, sometimes these variants come in the rule book themselves. And a good example of that is Formula D. Formula D, I find myself playing the basic version of that game a lot. Now, part of that is because this game I use as a gateway game pretty often and trying to teach players, um, about character powers and the different, uh, categories in which your car can break down and weather and all of that. Um, just complicates the game and I think complicates the game sometimes a little unnecessarily. Um, I find myself just teaching the basic version of the game where your car breaks down at the same rate no matter what part you're using, whether it be the brakes or the tires. And um, everybody has a different colored car and that's on your player card, but you don't have necessarily any special powers. And though sometimes I miss playing with those um, 
I guess, expert level rules. Um, I do find myself just playing the basic version a lot and having a lot of fun with it. Um, so if you've kind of shied away from the basic version of Formula D, I'd encourage you to go back and just try it out, at least with gateway level players. Uh, Sometimes a rule book comes in and at least to my reading of it, it's really fluid. It lets the players kind of pretty much decide how they want to play the game. Good example of this is games like uh, different dexterity games like Disc Duelers as well as party games and things like that. But Disc Duelers, Disc Duelers specifically, um, I find myself kind of picking and choosing what rules I want to play with. Um, Disc Dueler specifically is a dexterity game put out by Level 99 Games where you flick your discs at other discs. Um, and there's you have to declare whether you're moving your character around or you're attacking with your character because it, it, it depends on what you decide to do, how you affect other discs and other obstacles that get in the way on the table. Um, and those are pretty much all the rules I play with. If you look at this game, there's a way to play volleyball, there's a way to play soccer, there are player or character powers that come in the game. I don't really play with any of that. I just play a really basic um, game where I pick and choose what rules I want to play with. And I play with the movement and attack rules as well as put some obstacles on the table. And I found that that works really well. And this works even really well as a kid's game. Um... Another game where I found an online variant that seems to really smoothen the gameplay and um, get rid of a lot of kind of complications that might um, hinder a beginner gamer in the game is Sheriff of Nottingham. I found the Sheriff of Nottingham, which is Dice Tower Essentials game. It's a game where you um, bluff your way to hopefully uh, fill your market stand with as much sellable goods as you can, whether they're legal or illegal, and you want to smuggle it past the sheriff that each player takes turns being or assuming that role of uh and sheriff of nottingham i pretty much just get rid of the discard piles during the market phase i just let all the players draw from the draw pile itself it kind of ups the suspense as far as when players um get to the point in which they might be bluffing during the game um and i found that it really streamlines the process of gameplay if you play with that variant and other kind of variants that I um, use as optional um, in Marvel Legendary, I just make that game a purely co-op game. I don't mess with any of that competitive nonsense that comes in the game. And that way, it becomes a purely co-op game that you could um, encourage new players with because I use that game as a uh, uh, gateway game a lot. And another one is Networks. There's a variant of Networks that comes in the rulebook where... The game encourages you not to use the pink network cards when you're teaching the game. Um, and I found myself, even when I'm playing with players that have already played the game before, using that networks card deck less and less because it's a really fun game. And the network cards are fun too, but I found that that sometimes complicates the games a bit. And um, not only does it hinder beginner players, but it even hinders advanced gamers as well. Um, so those are some games that I've experienced I really enjoy the beginner level games, the family level games that sometimes come in the rule book or sometimes those variants come online and you have to search out for them. Um, what other games do you guys use the beginner level with, whether you're using it as a learning game or whether you're playing with people that already know how to play and just want to stick to the beginner level game? Well, anyway, my name is Bobby. This has been We'll Learn As We Go, and I'll see you on the next Throw Punch Lunch. Bye. Hey folks, welcome back to another Accessorize segment here on Throat Punch Lunch. I've got two things that I wanted to show you today. One thing is uh, some storage solutions from Zenbins, uh, which is a pretty cool company. They did a really good insert for Star Wars Rebellion. I've d done a review on that one a little bit back. You can go check that out. And then I'm also going to show you another storage solution from a different company called Meeple Realty. And they have got a pretty good box organizer for mission red planet so let's go ahead and get down to the table and i'll show you these two things so the first thing i'd like to talk to you about on sex rise today are these two in one containers from zen bins you've seen these kinds of uh, uh containers before uh where they hold your components in, in storage and they they make little uh you know dishes that you can pull the components out of and so forth during the course of the game uh the thing that's different about these is that you actually have two trays 
in one. So uh, at the beginning of the game, you're gonna be storing them like this, but then when you wanna start the game, you simply just have to take a few moments and get these guys set up like this. And now you have two trays that you can use during the course of your game. When you're done, you simply pour these guys back in there like that, and you have only one storage container that's taking up space in your uh, box. So I thought that was pretty cool uh, that they had this. So if you don't mind that little bit extra time during setup of taking the components out of one and put them into the other, this is actually a pretty cool thing because it does save space within your box. I mean, for example, you have these two here. These are from a game, uh, I'm sorry, geekbox.com. These are what they are, and they're very functional, very nice, um, but they're taking up a lot of room. So all the components that are in these for the Zen bins can fit inside one of them. And again, you just have that idea of, well, do I mind taking the extra few moments that it takes at the beginning of the game for setup to put this into both of its things. I mean, and, and literally it's just a few seconds of doing this. And I say all that, this is one of the things that I was worried about during the course of setup that I would actually have to take time for, for to get one component out of here and put it in the other. But it doesn't necessarily take that long. So if it's okay with you, for having to do this. This is a pretty cool storage solution for you to go to. Now, the next thing I wanted to show you on Accessorize is uh, something that was sent to me by the guys at Meeple Realty. And of course, it's not Mission Red Planet. It is their box organizer uh, for Mission Red Planet. Now, I didn't show how it's put together and all of a sudden stuff because they actually put it together for me. This was part of a deal uh, where I'm going to be painting their Healy miniatures for Blood Rage, and uh, in exchange for that, they sent me a uh, Mission Red Planet box organizer, and they put it together for me. I wasn't expecting them to put it together for me, but they did, so kudos, thank you for that. But I did want to show it off during Accessorize because I think it's one of their less frilly, more functional um, box organizers. So as you can see, this is just a regular old tray that holds all the components and has a little, a neat little rocket ship uh, first player token um, and all of the board pieces here for Mars. Then you open it up and you have all of these trays here that hold all of your pieces uh, very snugly within the box. It also has this tray right here that holds all of the other tokens that you're going to be using during the course of the game as well. And of course that goes right back in here like so. And then you also have these card boxes that will hold all the different cards. And as you can see, there's plenty of room for sleeving your cards in there as well. Uh, here are the smaller uh, cards for the um, discovery cards and that type of thing. And then over here, you have all of your player cards and so forth and so on. And as you can see again, I think there's probably plenty of room for sleeving your cards as well. So these will all fit, no worries whatsoever. All of this goes right back in the box like so. This fits snugly right here. And you put the rules back on top and you're good to go. So another really cool insert from Meeple Realty. So that's it from Accessorize. Let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Have you ever wondered what games you should keep or you should lose? Find out here at Purge Reviews. Welcome to Purge Reviews where we take two games, we keep one and we get one out of here and purge it. Today we're looking at Martin Walsh's Automobile versus Stronghold Games' Croftwagen. Automobile is a game that takes a look at the historical producing and selling of cars in America. You can be Henry Ford, you can be Chrysler, and you can be Howard. You will get to be these guys with individual powers that you can use for the round. In this game, you will only have 12 actions. Make the best use of them, and you will win the game. In Croftwagen, you're also producing and selling cars, and sometimes you get to take them for a spin, which is really fun. In this one, you're looking at more generic terms, but you are in Germany around 1928, give or take. 
and you will have an action selection system where you can take whatever action you want, but you may be giving your opponent more actions by doing so. Think Glenmore if you've played that one. Let's take a look at the theme of automobile versus Croft Volume. Well, they both do a very good job of hitting the spot when it comes to theme. I really do feel like I'm producing and selling these cars. In automobile, we get the actual people who did it. We get Henry Ford, we get Chrysler. With their powers, that kind of went with their personality. Phenomenal job at that. I really feel like I'm in this time period. I really feel like I'm producing and selling these cars. Great job. But in Kraftwagen, I really have to focus on the four aspects of the car. The body, the engine, the customer service that I provide, and the pricing of it. And there'll be different salesmen I need to com comply with in order to get my cards sold. Let's take a look at the components. Automobiles comes in a collector's edition, which is what I happen to have. The big addition to this is wooden cars. They look really cool, and I think the color in the game looks really neat. But this is more of an old school collector's edition. Think of Puerto Rico, where it's upgraded, but may not knock your socks off. In Kraftwagen, things are a little bit blander. The color scheme they went with is this, this muted blue that you may or may not like. But that board is phenomenal. That board is very functional, where I think the board for automobile is a lot more busy. They, both games rely heavily on tiles, and one just happens to have more color than the other. I would say this is kind of a wash, to be honest. The gameplay in the automobiles is you have to be efficient with your actions. You're only gonna have 12 player actions in the entire game. What you do with those actions will determine whether you win or lose. Where Kraftwagen seems to rely more on timing and when you're gonna do certain actions and beating your opponents, to not to actions, but to accomplishing what you wanna do before they can accomplish what they want to do. Kraftwagen also gives you different ways to win. You can build up engines or bodies or focus on customer service or focus on pricing. You can even go drive yours in a Grand Prix and maybe that's how you're gonna score your points. So there's a little bit different actions that you can do where with automobile, you're competing to produce and sell these cars and that's it. So if you want a different strategy, different ways to win, then maybe Crossvogen would be the way you would go. Crossvogen is very streamlined. Everything fits together perfectly. In conclusion, I have to get rid of one. I love both these games, but Automobile, you're out of here. And I love that action selection that they have here, where you can take what you want, but you'll be giving your opponent more options and more actions. Fantastic, I absolutely love it. We are the Brothers Murph, and this is Adventures in Board Gaming. live here in small town USA. This beautiful backdrop behind us is the city of Los Angeles. City of Angels. City of Angels. I wanted to go to a beautiful place in Los Angeles, one of the most picturesque, My favorite place in all amazing Los place in Los Angeles. We are here at the Griffith Observatory. Take a look. So this is the Griffith Observatory located in Griffith Park in Los Angeles. This used to be uh, a really, really great observatory back in the day, but with light pollution, doesn't really work much anymore. So now it's just an, a really, really great astronomy exhibit with great views. Yeah, and this is actually the first thing that we ever submitted to the Dice Tower. This was sort of like our audition video or a pilot, and we decided to, to go to the Griffith Observatory. Yeah, so we filmed this actually months and months ago, but we were watching it and we were like, oh yeah, we should post this. This should be fun. Yeah, it's a little less polished. And obviously you can see that our facial hair game was uh, a mess. A little too strong. Should never have gone out in public with that. I've learned my lesson. Yeah, beard game, too strong. <laughs> yeah, scary. Wow, what a montage. Whoa, what a lovely place. Wow. <laughs> Hollywood, am That's I right? That's right. Today, the game we decided to bring it to the Griffith Observatory is... Whoa, Patchwork. That's right. But brothers, Murph, what does Patchwork have to do with space? Ah, uh, you know, we just didn't want to bring Eclipse onto this rock. It's too much. Too much space. Way too much. We brought Patchwork, which is a fun little game where you're making Tetris things and using a button economy. And I had Nick talking about it, but I cut him out because look at that skyline. Look at that amazing LA skyline. Yeah, right let's there. focus on the skyline and not focus that from the side. You realize that Nick has absolutely no neck. Dude, you are, like, scary. Like, it seriously goes shoulder straight to head. Like, my head might as well be in my stern. I actually cut away because I was actually becoming upset looking at Nick's neck or no neck so that is patchwork that over there is the griffith observatory that's gonna be it for us check us out the brothers murph on all forms of social media that you can find here 
Let us know in the comments below where you like to play games. If you like to get out and play some games in it, we'd love suggestions. In fact, I think there's a Denny's out there in North Hollywood that still has a copy of our pandemic and we are watching you. Yeah, we're looking at you Denny's at Burbank and Lakersham. That's right. And remember, life's an adventure. So bring a game. Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. I'm Steve. My name's Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Wendell. And uh, this time we're talking about our flavour of the month again. And our flavour of the month this month is Lovecraft Letter. Now, Lovecraft Letter is a version of Love Letter with a Cthulhu theme behind it. Um, so if you've played Love Letter before, the same thing applies. You have a hand of one card, you draw a card off the deck, obviously these will be secret, and you play one of your two cards and do whatever that says. So you can play the Cats of Ulfar, and as a normal two in Love Letter, you get to look at someone else's hand, someone look at Jonathan's hand, and that might help me eliminate him later round. Um, and so I'm not going to go through much on Love Letter, you've probably seen it before, or at least the loads of other places you can go. I'm going to be looking at what makes Lovecraft Letter different to Love Letter. So the idea of Lovecraft, Lovecraft, Lovecraft Letter is you've got these insane cards as well, I don't know if you can see this, but basically this is a normal two, so if you play it normally, you would uh, be able to do the same thing. I'm going to look at someone else's hand, I'll look at Mark's hand. Ooh. And then I, it makes me insane. So there's got an insane ability at the bottom. And basically, if I'm insane at the start of my turn, the first thing I do is make a sanity check. I reveal the top card of the deck. If that's an insane card, I'll be out. But if it isn't, I now have the ability to do much more powerful things. If I now play any other card with an insane ability on, I get to do the bottom ability instead of the top. So this particular one says, normally a six allows me to swap hands with another player. This allows me to pick up everyone's hand and distribute them back how I want. Um, so there are lots of differences in the game. And the idea is you're trying to win, not five games like Love Letter, but you're trying to win uh, two games where you're sane, you get one of these chips, or three games where you're insane, you get one of these. Currently I'm insane. So if I particular, I limited these two, or I got down to, so the deck would run out and I had the highest card left, I would get one of these chips, and first one to two of those, or three of those, is the winner. What do we think? Yeah, I really like Love Letter anyway, and I've played it a lot, so it, it kind of feels very samey playing it again and again and again now. And this adds a whole lot more, it's really nice. So for every number you've got from the normal Love Letter, you get the kind of Cthulhu version of it on top. Uh, and so for a gamer like me, I really appreciate it. I enjoy this more than Love Letter, personally. So I'm the opposite end to you, is that I actually don't particularly like the standard Love Letter, I just find and maybe it's got overplayed, or maybe it just got very samey for me quite quickly. It just found it a little bit too limiting. While this is certainly better, much like I found with the Lux version, it just adds the extra bit of dimension that it needs to make it that more playable for me. A bit more chaotic, I think. I find Love Letter yes. almost... I mean, good players will be good at Love Letter quite obviously, and they'll just be able to work out the percentages quicker. Well, this is just a little bit harder. There's more going on, and there's more things to ruin your day. I definitely think it's a gamer's version of Love Letter. I yeah. think the, the good benefit, and I played Lost Legacy, which is a similar one, they tried to make it a bit gamey, and because you, you, all the cards were new and they did different things, the one did a different thing, the two did a different thing, this is very nice in that all the cards, even the insane cards, do the same as a normal card until you become insane. So if I play the insane six and I'm not insane, it's actually just a normal six. So that's quite nice. So you can bring the people who've played before in, um, and they will... Uh, they will be aware of what all the cards do, and so there's not much, too much to learn, and it still becomes quite a quick game. The only thing is, is if you're playing it for the first time, or with a bunch of people who haven't played it before, it is quite slow, because you know, you've got a whole bunch of new cards, like, what does this one do? Oh, Anna's an insane ability as well. Can I do the insane ability yet, or it not? It has the eternal I'm... flicking over of yeah, the, right. the uh, help I mean, cards. The crib sheet is quite helpful, but that's it's right. It's still excited. The first game, you're going to spend a long time reading yeah. all the cards. Yeah. I would also say, Mark mentioned it was a deluxe version. Um, as you can see, it comes in this kind of nice uh, open-bound box with a magnetic strap, and it comes poker with chips. these sleeves and poker chips. And I know it's more expensive than the regular love letter, but they've really gone over in kind of component quality. Poker chips are lovely, the sleeves are really nice, and the cards are much bigger yeah. with much better graphics than oh, right. previous love letters. Yeah, I do like the art. I actually think it plays well with more players. It plays up to six as well, and I think it probably shines about five, whereas Jonathan probably says it shines about three or four. Yeah, four would be my perfect number. Um, but if you're a fan of Love Letter and you like a, you know, you know, a gamer, I think this is a better version of it, personally. Okay. Mm. Uh, I've been Steve at Flavor of the Month at Board Game Opinions. I'm Jonathan Hicks. And I'm Mark Wendell. Thank you very much. Bye. Hey everybody, Eamon Steven here. Today I'm going to give you some of my teaching tips 
for Ticket to Ride. First thing I do when teaching Ticket to Ride is tell the players that the goal is to get the most points and that you get points in three different ways. One, by placing trains on the board, which based on the number of trains you place corresponds to the number of points you will get. Second, if you complete tickets, which are cards in which you're trying to get from one city to the other and you get the points on the bottom right, and also remind players if they don't complete tickets that they will get negative that many points. And thirdly, if they have a long continuous route, they might get longest train for bonus points at the end of the game, or globetrotter, which is if you complete the most tickets at the end of the game, you might get an extra bonus. The next tip I have for new players is with the ticket cards that you will use to place on the routes on the board. When taking cards, remind players that taking a while might not be the most efficient, especially early on in the game because you only get one card. Whereas if you take two uh, different colors that aren't wilds, you will get two cards instead of just one wild. Also, remind players that when they are taking different colors, that might cue other players as to where they are going on the map. Speaking of the board, another tip for new players is to remind them that there are certain choke points on the board that veterans know exist already if they've played the game multiple times. So remind them that Nashville to Atlanta is only one train of any color, so many players will play that at the beginning of the game. While as from Kansas City to St. Louis, it is easier to wait a little bit longer to play that route because two different players can play it on the double route. The next tip has to do with the ticket cards, in which you need to remind players that taking tickets that are closer together will be easier to complete. But for instance, from Seattle, Las Vegas to Washington to Atlanta, these tickets will be very hard to complete because one is on the East Coast versus one on the West Coast. So remind players that maybe taking, in this instance, Boston to Miami and Washington to Atlanta might be easier to complete and save your trains because they are on a similar route. One of the options on a player's turn is to take tickets, and it's important to remind new players that maybe if it's your first time you want to complete all the tickets you got at the beginning of the game as to not overwhelm yourself with new tickets and trying to complete a bunch of routes at once. The last tip I have for new players is for the end of the game, remember that it's when a player has two or less trains. So make sure to remind new players to keep an eye on everyone at the table so that they know when the game might end. Okay guys, those are my teaching tips for Ticket to Ride. Hopefully that will help new players jump in and maybe even teach some of those vets some new tricks. We'll see you next time. Hey everyone, welcome to another Fruit Punch Lunch and another episode of The Starting Tile, your first point of contact for saying which games you should use to introduce new players to the hobby. Today we're taking a look at a fairly lightweight push your luck game that has kind of flown under the radar for a lot of people now. It was buzzed about a bit more last year, come around Essen time, but since then I haven't seen anyone play it, I haven't seen it brought out in board game cafes, and I feel that... Maybe it just needs that little bit of extra love. You know, I did a top 10 Zen games recently, and this game almost made that list. It would have been like 11 or 12. So it is definitely one to play with those who just want something very light, just very hmm, easy going to play. And that is K Kanagawa, or Kanagawa, or however you want to pronounce it. This is a little filler game by Brunica Fala and Charles Chevel. <laughs> Chevalier, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name, I'm not very good with names, but this is a kind of a mix between a tableau building slash push your luck game. It's very straightforward. You're basically building a giant panoramic painting in front of you, and these will consist of pictures of various uh, types of weather, types of landscape, various objects like people, buildings, animals, that kind of thing. And what you're trying to do is effectively collect sets in order to gain more points. You want to have like the longest painting for more points. You want to have a, a decent studio underneath for uh, allowing more options for how you can paint your picture. There's more to this than meets the eye. What you're doing is that you have a tableau in front of you of cards and a row of cards will be laid out in a mixture of face up and face down order. And then what you have a choice of doing is either leaving it for the moment or taking a column of cards. And these will be a mix of face up and face down. 
If you choose to wait, then the next player gets to unveil another row of cards, and then has the same choice. If you take a column, you have to find a way to either insert them into your studio, which involves using the uh, left-hand side of the card, so we're talking multi-use cards here, a mechanic I really like, um, using the right-hand side of it, which is the actual painting that goes on top. You have your own little player board. And depending on whether you feel someone else is going to take that column of cards before you, is that kind of push your luck aspect. Because if you take less cards, you're guaranteed to get what it is you wanted in the first place. But if you wait, you'll get more cards. But will they all be useful? And will they still be there by the time it gets back round your turn in case another player takes it off you? So we're not talking like, oh my god, my head type mechanics here. But just nice light, free-flowing, and pretty well streamlined. You have to maybe just check the rule but once or twice just to make certain you fully understood how the like paint pot uh, movement works, but other than that, it's pretty easy. The scoring is straightforward. You pretty much have you know your sets of symbols, your row of paints, these little objective tiles that you can grab at various stages to say, I have gained three different types of animals. I'll take this one for points and you just add them up and see who wins. And then go again, because it's that short, you'll be able to get multiple games of this easily. It's gonna work with anybody, really. Kids, family, people who normally get angry. You know, it should be an ideal way of getting people into this game, and um, sorry, into the hobby. And even though that I've actually, this didn't make my top 100 this year, it's still in my top one, two, five, I think. It's, um, I have to double check. But it definitely is a game that I still have in the collection. I still, you know, it had a place. Right there, right there, that's where it's just come from. And I can onto it because it is a very nice light game. And you know what? I might take this to the next convention I go to because I feel it uh, needs to get more love. So Kanagawa, or Kanagawa, I really can't remember how you pronounce it. It's a great little light game, definitely one worth considering for gateway purposes. So that's all for me on this segment. I hope you've enjoyed this Fruit Punch Lunch episode because I know I'm at the end of it. And, you know, see you on the next time when I talk about another gateway game that you should consider for introducing new people into the hobby. Remember, though, that no matter what, these are only games, and you should just have a good time. So that's that for Throw Punch Lunch. Again, I want to send my heartfelt thanks for all of you guys taking time to uh, spend some time with us here talking about our great hobby. I also want to thank all of my contributors for the awesome job that they are doing. They do a lot of hard work. And this is only one of the things that they do for the hobby and for the community. So I want to thank them so much for staying on the ball. And I hope that they will continue to do this for a long time in the future because I enjoy watching all the segments probably more than you guys do. But I sincerely want to thank everybody. We hope that you're having a great day and that it continues. Well, we're going to get on out of here. We'll see you guys on the next episode of Throat Punch Lunch, the show that's nicer than it actually sounds. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.